So going back to what we started uh, uh, last lecture, at the end of the last lecture, is uh, again, like thinking of the style at the beginning of the course, we went all hands on. We wrote, we wrote a few examples, maybe six or seven, developing them a little bit without delving into details of specific blocks we have used. For example, we didn't have one lecture explaining what is a full loop or how loops are being written or why loops or how to do conditions in a, in a proper way or switch statements or how variables are being defined in different types of variables. So in that sense, this is a little bit different from how usually programming is being taught. Usually, if you follow a very normal flow, it will be, well, we did one topic today, look about loops. We cover it in a little bit of detail, and then we have a few examples. But I wanted to start the course a little bit different, just first of all, to those that are not familiar with C, which I'm assuming most of you put some familiarity with that, along with lab zero. So you break this ice between you and the language, uh, but also we wrote different type of blocks, so the examples were crafted to touch on multiple things we're going to cover in detail in the coming two, three lectures. So you're not seeing them for the first time. So when we talk about them, again, you have familiarity, and then this will allow you to better understand the concept, right? Given that we have achieved, hopefully achieved this target, and my advice is that if you don't really start doing this, try to code these examples in your own without looking to the slides, see how the output looks like, play around with them, similar to what we have done in the lecture, and once you do this, again, you increase your familiarity with the, with the coding and the problems you might see. If you look into the examples in the slide without really coding them yourself, at all, this is a pretty easy example, it's like two, three lines, right? But if you don't write it down yourself, you will never really see what problems you might come up with, right? Or getting a semicolon or using a variable without defining it, or you're doing the full in the incorrect syntax. So programming usually comes as a skill, right? It's not really a new knowledge where similar to some other courses, you read the textbook, you solve the assignments, and you are done, right? It's something that's practical, it's hands-on, so you have to really spend that time, and this is the correct way that I would advise everyone to really study this course, is go through the slides, look into the examples, code them yourself, like using Eclipse or MindVDB or any other compiler, and now, if you, if you are stuck, you revisit the solution, and then you move forward, right? In that case, you learn faster and in a more efficient way. So given that we have covered these examples, now is the time to really delve more into details, understand really what more of what is behind the scene. And as I said, these kind of kind of lecture might be a little bit more dry than what we had before because they have less coding examples, and the intention is to cover the rules, right? Once we cover the rules, we'll go back and apply these rules in examples. So hopefully you bear with me a little bit in these two, two lectures. So we already went through this. We started by defining variables. We said what is the purpose of a variable, and we said the main the main idea of a variable is in fact you are looking something in the memory with a certain type, with a certain storage kind of, of, of um, storage or memory size or storage size. Later on, you would put values on and you use later on, right? So this is the main purpose of a variable. And then we said for every variable in C, you cannot really use without declaring. And declaring a variable would require a type, right? It's, it's completely different than interpreted languages where, in fact, I can define, I can use a variable without defining it, I can change its type on the fly, I can use x as a string and then later on as, a, as an integer. This does not happen in C. C is known to be a strict programming language. In fact, most compiler languages are like this. Why? Because they are not dynamically interpreted, right? You combine the put first, you obtain a binary, and then you execute it later on, right? So doing so, you must really know how much memory you need for your big variable. So one purpose of having a type, and we already mentioned this before, is well the amount of memory needed to store this variable in. As we will learn later in this lecture, well, having a variable of type end would require, for example, four bytes. But having a variable of type float might require, third, um, well, float might be also four bytes in some systems. Let's say double would require 64 bits or eight bytes. A character, on the other hand, is just one byte. So based on each type, you would need to store uh, in the memory different, or well, you need to allocate different sizes for the memory, for this value, right? Is there a question? Are these slides supposed to have Yeah, not okay. yet. So I'll put them up for the yeah. um, Another thing that a type dictates is also what are the set of possible values, right? For example, if you define a variable as an end, then you know that it cannot really get a floating point value, right? It cannot be 3.5, for example, because it has to be integer, right? So a type also tells you what are the possible values you can get. 
Think, for example, about well, C does not have, uh, does not have an uh, inherent string by it, but it has a character. And we will learn later on the characters and nothing other than integers. So I'm trying to, to write, say, an example. Let's say about float, for example. Float versus double, right? So we have float type and we have double type. So float is a floating point variable, so it's a semi precision floating point. And double is a double precision floating point. And these things will come more when you know about. 2DI, how you represent binaries or how you represent values in, in modern machines. But simply, float is a more compressed format for a value, which means it can take less values. For example, in C, float are 32 bit, which means well, you can represent up to a certain number that is floating point, right? But then if you need well, a more precision, then you use double. So the range of values supported for double is even more, right? So uh, this is the second thing. So you don't need to really to care about the actual value. You just need to understand the essence. The first essence is a type tells you how much memory you need for this variable. The second thing is a type tells you what are the set of possible values, the legal values for this type. For example, I cannot define an end and put a string into it, right? The third one is what are the operations that are legal for this variable, right? So every type has a legal set of operations that might not be legal for other types, as we will learn later on. But, so these are the main three things that a type defines. In this, this knowledge is independent of C. Any program, any combined programming language, in fact, would adhere to these three things. So this is the purpose of having types in programming languages, right? And this topic even goes beyond really programming. For example, for compilers, if you can compile a course, then also, well, to combine the language, you need, based on the type of the variable, you need to interpret these three things. Good. Okay, some of the basic data types we have in C. So we have character. This is more or less the smallest type in C because it's only one byte or eight bits. We have int, which based on the machine can be 16 or 32 bits. Most of our modern machines are in fact 32 bits. And I give you one example in one of our early lectures of why it's important to know about types. So for example, you are using a variable in a loop. And you know that your bound on the number of loop iterations is something that is less than 100, for example. We might have mentioned this example in the, in the past lecture. We said, well, 100 means it's less than 127, which means I need seven bits to really represent it, right? So instead of really defining something as an int, which might be 32 bit, I'm wasting my memory. I might use something like a short int, for example. It's why we have types with an int. So we have short and we have long. Int by default is long, but then short is a shorter way. In fact, in modern C uh, uh, standards, we have also what we call UNT8, UNT16, UNT32, which allows you to really specify what would be the number of bits you have there. But for now, let's just use short for this. You can think, for example, as short, these are again machine independent, but in our modern machine, you can think of short as 16 bit, while long is the normal 32 bit. Uh, and int with its two types, short and long, uh, well, are only representing, um, well, like um, complete digits in a sense, you know, no fraction, right? So you cannot really have something again as floating point there, 3.5, 3.2. To do this, you can either use float or double. Float is a single precision floating point, it takes 32 bit, while double is allowed for more precision, double precision floating point. In fact, if you want something that is giving goes beyond double, so we can use long double, but this is barely used, right? because it, it, it takes a lot of memory and you only need it if you have something that is very scientific that depends on, for example, I want, I don't know, the 30th digit after the, the, and the floating point, right? Which is, you, you, you barely need this in a real life example, right? And it's something that's very, very accurate, usually are the scientific applications. Then, in addition to, uh, to types, we have what we can call identifiers. What I mean by this is, you can define an int as signed or unsigned, and we'll learn later on why it really makes sense to do this. By default, all these types are signed, which means they can represent negative and positive values, right? So for example, if I'm telling you that int is 32 bit, right? So you cannot really say the maximum value is two to the power 32, right? Why? Because it has negative and positive, so you have to define it by two, right? So it, it really represents from negative two to the power 31, up to 2 to the power 52 minus 1, right? So you really define your range by half, half for the negative and half for the positive. 
But what if, for example, I know that all my values that I'm using for this variable are positive ones? I mean, going back to the counter example, or the iteration count, right? In that case, it might be better if you use the, un uh, the, the unsigned uh, uh, reserved word in front of n to tell them, in fact, I only need positive values. In that case, it's useful because it gives you the full range of the number of bits for the positive value. So instead, let's say I have an 8-bit variable. If it was negative and positive, then you really have 2 to the power 7, negative 2 to the power 7, up to 2 to the power 7. So it's negative 127 up to, well, in fact, you have to divide by 2. So it's negative 64 to plus 63, right? But if you define it as unsigned, so everything is positive, so you have the full 8 bits for yourself. Right? Well, I said 8 bits. That's straight to the power 8 minus 1. This gives me 256, about 128. So, yes, if you have something that's signed and 8 bits, then it's negative 127 up to plus 127. But if you have something that is only unsigned, so you take the full 8 bits for the positive range, so it starts from 0 up to 255. Right? So you increase your range of values because you excluded the negative ones. Right? So this is also important if you care about how much memory you are using. Are you actually define it as signed or unsigned? Yeah, we will come into this. You just really write, in, instead of saying index, you just say signed index. Right? Something like this. So one thing I've told you here is what well, the amount of memory. We will discuss also, and we'll have a table for this. The set of possible values, this will also depend on how many bits are assigned. But the third Purpose or third objective of having a type is what operations can be performed in a variable. And to do this, we need really to go quickly through the possible arithmetic operations in C programming language. This is pretty much a very quick revision because it's the same thing for most programming languages. You have your natural operator, something like plus or minus later on, we'll see that there is an auto increment, I plus plus, for example, and decrement. There are binary operators where you nearly need two variables for them addition, uh, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modulus operation. There is something that is it's a very important trick in C, and this is a little bit different than other programming languages, which is, in fact, if both operands of the division are integer, this is called integer division, and the output will also be integer. What I mean by this, if we define, divide 5 by 2, your output will not be 2.5, as expected. It will only be 2. The reason is 5 is an end, 2 is an end. That means it's an integer division. That means the destination is also an end. And then it will do truncation. So it will give you only two. And this is also one of the common mistakes that I, I see usually in C programs. Is you don't really pay attention to what are the operand types of this operator. Right? And this is one example of how really the type defines what are the operations you are doing. Right? Here we see a normal operator, which is division, that will behave differently between floats and double from one end and ends from the other end. Does this make sense? And then, well, we, you guys know what is the modulus operation already. Uh, uh, well, it only applies to integers in, in, uh, in C. Um, well, evaluation of expression. Again, this goes beyond C. It's the same as in Python. What are the precedence and the associativity rules? Well, just that. In fact, your calculator applies exactly the same rules as C, as Python. It's just the same thing. Right? For example, well, can someone tell me what is the order of operations we have here? Uh, what? Or maybe in other words, what will this evaluate to? Let's start with the order of operations because what this evaluates to involves is really two tricks, not one. So what, what are the order of operations we have? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Because the value of the game have the same precedence, you start from the left. So you have 7 divided by 9, you take the value, multiply this by 3, and then addition comes later, so you add. Exactly. Thank you. Well, now comes the second question, what this evaluates to. What do you think? Yeah. 8.33? 8.33. Okay. 6. 8.33 or 6? Yeah. 9. 9. Great. What do you think? Now we have three values. 6, 9, or 8.333. Let's mention the rules that we, we, we discussed so far. 
Well, the order is correct. Your frame is correct that I will do seven by nine first, and then multiply by three, and then add two six. But the point is seven by nine. What what value this will give me? Zero. Is there any other option here? Zero, right? Because again, it's an integer division. Seven by nine is just zero, right? So zero multiplied by three is zero. And then add this to six to give you six, right? So you you see really how you should pay attention to the, the small rules while you are programming. Good? Yeah, please. That's an excellent question. So if you define your data file as float, then this will no longer be an integer division. Then you will divide seven by nine, it will give you that correct fraction, which I don't know for now. You multiply it by three and then you add this to six. So yes, it will give you another one. Yeah. Intuitively, the TN is saying how if you put like 7.0 in the fraction, then it would see it as a token. Yeah, that's also possible. But then you put adding to reduce 6.0. Correct. 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 That's correct. Because here, if you say 7.0, well, those, those are both immediate values in the programming language. You, you don't define those as variables, they're just values, right? Immediate values. Immediate values guess the correct time. So if you just write 7, well, the compiler will interpret this as an int. But if you write 7.0, then this will be defined as a fraction. Well, no, no allocation will be done in memory because this is an immediate variable, so it will be in a register. But 7.0 7 will be a float, so this will be a float division, and yes, it will also give you the correct Good. Good. So here, well, we give the precedence table only for your reference. Again, Nothing is different than any other thing you have learned already from high school math, right? It just applies the same thing. Okay, so assignment expression. Just say, let's say, well, I have a left hand side, right hand side of the assignment. Um, and then you basically say there's an expression that evaluates to a value that I put into a variable here. You just say, well, I assign this expression value into the variable. If I write something like y equal this, then eventually y will get this value, right? Uh, and this is how you write this assignment. Why why are really right? saying this should be the rule for the assignment operator? Because for example, you cannot have here in the left hand side of the assignment operator an expression, right? For example, you cannot say expression one equal one, right? It doesn't make sense. Because the point is that you want to put a value in a variable. Expression is not a variable, it's not a memory storage. Right? So it won't, you not really, cannot really store something into it. So it's always the case that you should have a variable in the left-hand side of the assignment radio, because the variable is a place in memory that you can really store values in. Right? Well, in C, you can also this, do this kind of uh, compounded or, or short uh, notation of, of operators. For example, plus equal uh, means, well, if I say x plus equal 2, we will have Let's, let's see an example. If I say this, x plus equal 3, this in fact means x equal x plus 3, right? Well, minus is the same thing, multiplication is the same thing. It's just a short or a compound uh, syntax of writing, right? Well, I have seen really in professional code that they will try to avoid this as much as they can. The reason is you want to avoid any confusion. And for example, if you want to do uh, exporting to another programming language that does not support this, you make it easier for automated tools to really export it, right? But just to let you know the rule, if you see it in an already existing code, you understand what it does. Okay, unary operators. Unary operators are, what well, they are called unary because they only take one operand. Uh, the, the most two famous ones are pre increment and post increment, or increment and decrement, whether they are pre or post. There are also some tricks here that we should learn. Pre-increment means, well, this value should really get the value incremented by one before you calculate your expression. Post-increment means value will only get incremented after you evaluate your expression. I know that what I'm saying right now might not make any sense to you, so we'll have, we'll have a couple of examples. But the same rule applies for decrement, pre and post. So let's have an example here. Uh, okay, so not yet an example, but you can write something like this. This is not allowed. Well, really makes sense because I cannot really say 5 equal 5 plus 1. Why I cannot do this? 
because we just really had the assignment mode, which you must have in the left hand side of the assignment available. If you increment five to six, where to store it? I don't know. So this is not allowed. But you, you cannot also write something like this. Why? Because this is again an expression. If you really write this in the correct form or the, the detailed format with the verbose format, you'll say x plus three equal x plus three plus one. Which means there is an expression in the left hand side of the assignment. Again, that's not possible because it's not a variable, right? So you must really have a variable that gets the increment then. So let's see what we mean by real post here. Let's have this full snippet. So I define three integer values, i equal one, a equal zero, and b equal zero. And then I write a equal plus plus i. When the plus plus comes first, this is called pre increment, right? What we really mean is before you evaluate this expression, you should increment the value of i. Right? So in this line, there are two operations you need to conduct. The first one is to increment i because it's a pre-increment. The second one is to assign this value to a, which means after the end of this line, what would be the value of i? What do you think? Two. Yeah, because I was initially one and I incremented it. And what would be the value of A? Two as well, thank you, right? Because in that case, I incremented I first and then assigned it to A, right? This is what we really mean by re-increment. And then I move forward, so I say I equal one, so I overload I. And then in the last line, I do a post increment in C, right? Which means there are also two operations I need to conduct, but their order now will differ. So the first operation would be assign i to b, and the second one would be increment i. So at the end of this line, again, what would be the value of i? 2. But what would be the value of b? 1. Because b gets i before i is incremented. So this is what is meant by post increment. Is that clear? Make sense? So it's very important to understand this. So uh, also this is something that is very common during rational uh, operations, well, larger than, less than, or than or equal, less than or equal, uh, doing the quality operators, so check equal equal or not equal. Uh, here, if you write something like A is larger than or equal to zero, this really evaluates to whether it's true or false, and the same thing here. Uh, so uh, one important note that you should really uh, take care of, I don't know if I have a written warning later on what about it. But something I see very, very common in C programs, especially for those that are new to the language, is sometimes, for example, I write an if condition. Assume you have an if condition, and then you want to check equality. You say, for example, if x equal e, right? Sometimes you really replace the equal equal, which is your equality operator, with equal only, one equal, which is your assignment operator. Right? So you say if x equal a, you write something like, uh, okay, so I'm going to get my brain working. So if I write something like this, if a, I'm not sure if this is visible for everyone. So if we write this, well, first of all, is this what you really meant? Most likely not, right? In fact, what you usually mean here, because it's an equality checking operator, you just do equal equal. You might expect that if you only do one equal, But the compiler might complain. But the compiler in C will not complain. And this is really a problem because it's very hard to, this is what makes this case very hard to debug. Is you'll never get a syntax error or a compiler error. The, com the program will run successfully. Well, it will run, but not successfully, in fact. But what will happen? What will the compiler really do is this is an assigned operator. So x will get the value of a. Right? Because you say x equal a, so x will get the value of a. Does this make x now equal a? Yeah, because x got the value of a, right? So in that case, this, this expression will always evaluate to true. Right? 
And this is what makes it hard to debug. To avoid this, what you can do, especially for example, let's, let's replace A by 3, something that's an immediate value. One guard to mitigate this problem, and this is a programming trick, is to really put your immediate value here in the left of the operation. Why this is like a good trick? Because we already mentioned that if you forgot and you only had one assignment, one equal, this is an not allowed, this is syntax error, right? So the compiler now will complain to you because you cannot have a value in the left hand side of the assignment operation. Because you cannot put something in three, three is an immediate value, it's not really a memory base. So you guard against that the compiler will overlook this. So if you forgot for any reason about this equality, the compiler will have a syntax error. Good. This is also a kind of a programming brat strip. Okay. So what it was well this? Did you guys went through like gates, logic gates in 2DI or in high school? So you know what are add or not, right? Is there anyone that doesn't know really what, what this means? Okay, good. So, well, here, this, this exclamation mark is just nothing other than really a not operation, which means if the exhibition is true, well, that, that what the exhibition will evaluate to by the not is false and the other way around. So, if I say something like I, sorry, if I say something like not seven less than or equal to six, what would this evaluate to? True or false? True, true, you guys are saying true, so let's see why. So first of all, before the not, seven less than or equal six, that's false. No false is true, so the overall expression is very true, that's correct. And then also for logical operation, we have logical and and logical or. So if I have something like this, just jump to the examples directly. First of all, if you want to write something like this as an expression, it's not a valid programming expression. It's simple in Python, so you must have already seen it. It's not really allowed in C. But what you can do is to break this condition, which is you want to say A is larger than or equal to 2, Y is less than or equal to 6. You should break it into two different conditions and then add them. So you say A is larger than or equal to 2 and A is less than or equal to 6, right? It's just straightforward. So, wow. When is this true? What do you think? A is larger than or equal to 2, or A is less than or equal to 6. Yeah. Yeah, any here value, it's always true. Exactly, because, well, if you look into the, 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 the number line, it's A is larger than or equal to 2, this includes anything 2 and above 6, anything that is 6 and blue. So it, in fact, includes all the, number, all the possible valid values for integers, right? So it's always true. That's correct. This is you already know, again, the truth table for AND and OR. To have two expressions as, as true for the AND, both of them should be really true, right? While to have the overall expression of two expressions all together to be false, both of them should be false. Right? Again, we just extend our table with the precedence, including our uh, uh, equality and logical, uh, logical operations. Oh. And now one additional thing that we'll see variables in, and we have seen this in, again in lecture one, just really what is the correct syntax of a program. Well, my main function, we have seen a few times uh, until now, and then you have optional declaration of variables and then statements, and then you just return zero to indicate that there is no variable. Uh, now, let's have a few examples of correct and incorrect variable definitions. One, someone, can, uh, someone was asking about whether or how to write signed or unsigned. Basically, as I was saying, you put this unsigned in front of the end, which means, well, all of these variables will now be unsigned. Well, what is wrong here? You don't need negative numbers for the here. 
So you're having wasted memory for having a sign. E, well, what you say is 100% correct, but that's an optimization. This doesn't make this statement incorrect in C, right? So what you say is correct. I agree with you, this might not be the best way because they don't need all these steps to best and here, although it can make sense. But it's still a functionally correct. So the compiler will not really complain to you for that reason. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. So it's basically because we have a comment that should be really a screen call. Every single sentence in C, we know from day one that should end that with a semicolon, right? Well, this is a valid one. I define two variables to be flow. We have seen also this multiple times, but I didn't comment about this then before, which is in fact, you can define multiple variables similar to here and here in the same uh, line, right? By just writing the type once and you separate your, your variables by comma, right? So this, for example, is equivalent to say unsigned in day, unsigned in month, unsigned in year, right? I just really put them all in one declaration. It's called multivariable declaration in C. Right. Again, every programming language allows very good this. And here I'm defining two variables, both of them are flowed. Well, this is not allowed. Why does it not allow it? Yeah. Special characters. Special characters, thank you. Because the name of the variable should really adhere to, uh, well, the, the syntax of programming languages, which is again the same for every programming language. Here I'm using special characters, which is not allowed. The only special character that's allowed in a variable is Underscore, thank you. And then, well, this is also allowed. So this is a little bit different than other ones that I'm doing really also declaration and initialization at the same time. And you can initialize your variables using different values. So you can say int i equals zero, then comma m, not initialized, and then j equals one. In that case, this is completely equivalent, I get to say int i equals zero, and m, and then j equals one. So you can declare and initialize your variables in the same way. So this is all what we need really to know so far about variables. Right? Is there any question here? It's more like a revision, right? It's just make sure we go through all the rules and we highlight the tricks that you should pay attention to. Yeah. Then statements, we said statements should really end by semicolon. This is a valid statement in C. Why? So this is equivalent to say a equals a plus one. So it's a valid expression, right? Using the, the both increment. Then. then again, it's also a valid statement. This is also a valid statement, surprisingly, right? Well, this is also a valid statement in C, just really do nothing at all. But we have seen this hundred times. This is not a valid statement for the same reason as before, which is we're missing the semicolon here, right? This one, again, replacing the semicolon with a comma. So that's not a problem, right? It's a few examples of what might be the mistakes you can have. So far, so good. A little bit boring. Yeah, it's good. What would happen to the first season? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So let me ask you what you think. This is a, yeah, let's just think together. So first of all, this is an expression, right? It's a valid expression because I'm adding two variables. Let's say, for example, B is one and C is three. So I add both, it gives me four. But I don't put them anywhere. So the value is not stored. So I conducted that operation, but I really didn't store anywhere. Right? So really effectively, from a functional perspective, nothing would happen. Yeah, but... yeah there was a question. Yes. So we have seen if statements before. Uh, so same way, if statement, if you think about, and this is something that is very important once we go to blocks of code, if you think of the flow chart perspective of the program, right? So this kind of organizes your, your thought about what algorithm you want to write. So if I think about an if statement, an if else statement, same way, you go into a condition. Did you guys have flow charts in the Python first year course? You, so you have learned very how to look into the program from a high level perspective is something that's good. So I come here into this point of the program, I have a condition, and now this is really called a controlled path divergence in, in, in the program, which means the program can take different paths based on the condition itself, right? So if the condition is true, well, you will take the F, which is action A. If the condition is false, you will take the S. What if I didn't have the S? Because previously we only had F. What if we didn't? I don't have the S. What would happen? 
Yes, yeah, so you will not have anything here, right? But the way you should, you should write your flow is simply if it relates to false, you just try best action A, as you were saying, and leave, and then go to this point. So this path here wouldn't have any extraction, but you'll just jump directly to what's after, right? Which is exactly that. Good? So the way you write it in C is again, everything is explicitly as a put block in between curly brackets. You just write if and else, just straightforward. Well, let's let's have a couple of examples. Assume that x and y and z are ends, and let's think together how does each of the following kind of full snippets uh, evaluate you, right? Or what they will print really on the screen. So, first good block is this one. If x is less than y, z equals x, I print something else, z equals y, I print something. Let's, let's first think of this. What will this evaluate you? I really didn't say values, initial values of x and y, but what do you think will be printed at the end of the screen? Yeah, well, the program is really comparing x and y, right? Saying if x is smaller, you really break it. Otherwise, you break y, right? This is really what it does, because you assign this value to z and then you print z. So for example, if x over 3 and y is 4, this condition will be true. So you, you take this path and then you take the smaller value here and you print it. So you have 3. So this code here is really printing the smaller value, right? What about this one? Yeah, that's exactly the same thing. And the reason is, if I have two variables and I want to print a smaller using a third variable, it's just enough to say, well, assign z to any of them. It doesn't really matter, right? And then you check your condition. If the condition is true, you override z. Otherwise, well, z is still with this value. And you also print the smaller. So take the example of 3 and 4 again. If x is 3 and y is 4, I start by saying z equals 4. 3 is less than 4. So z will be 3 now, and then I break 3, right? So just rewriting the code exactly in the same way, but without using the address, right? Make sense? Yeah, please. Do you have any brackets on the period? Yeah, that's also another reason why I have this example, is I said it in one of the lectures, but just it's good to emphasize it here. So explicitly in C, good blocks are in curly brackets, right? But I said before that if you have an if or for that consists only of one statement, then the compiler will make this statement is really the condition of the value there, right? So in that case, it's just completely exactly equivalent to say f x less than y, and then you put a curly bracket here and there, right? What's risky here is maybe you forgot, and in this case, you wanted the bracket to be inside, but it will never be inside. So this is why I said also it's a good programming bracket to always put the curly brackets regardless, right? Even if you have a single statement, both are going to bracket, both this one statement and close it. Right? Just the correct syntax that I wanted to show you. Good. Okay. So what if we have nested f else, f else, f else, which also is, is, is possible in and that, that's the general format of an f in any programming language. The way you can do this is to say, but the way like nested f is different than uh, f else, right? So here, what I'm doing is, I have a condition, which is absolutely, do I have the snippet here? Yeah. So basically what I mean by a nested f is not the fs block, but rather multiple f's inside each other, right? So here, this would be the condition of the first f here. So here I have action c, d, b, what do I call this? Action c, b, d, right? And there is condition one, Condition one in the first f, condition two in the in the inside f, and this there is no condition three. Okay, good. So the way that this code is being written is I, the first if statement is based on the first condition. If this if is true, well, inside this if I should execute a code block, right? So this is more detailed code block of what is inside the f, right? So this is in fact this thing here. 
the software representing everything inside this error, right? But it's just more detailed here because I have another FS inside, and then based on the second app, which is in condition two, whether it's true or false, I either execute CAB. If this F is false, then this is the second thing here, which is this F is false, so I jump to the else, and this is just a simple code block, right? So you can't think really of this code block as just one thing, but it has some detail. And with the same terminology, in fact, this action C can also be another nested F for a for loop or anything else, right? So code blocks, they are defined by the way that you really can have multiple blocks inside them, right? Make sense? Okay, so let's look into two variations of this and let's see really whether they make, uh, make any difference or not. Uh, so, what do we see? F doing this, F doing this, F. Okay, so the only thing that I have done here is I remove these curly brackets with the first F. Right? Does this make them equivalent or not? What do you think? I think this is maybe omitted. Yeah, so this is already what we mentioned in the previous example, but we wanted to confirm here one important note, which is the if statement with all its else or if else or whatever it has is considered by the compiler as a single state, right? So this if else here, all of this code block, even if it's hundreds of lines of code, from the compiler perspective, it's an if statement, right? Which means if I remove, remove these curly brackets, I still make this F is part of this error. So these two are completely equal. Does this make sense? Going back to the visual view, I'm looking into this whole thing as one state because it's an F state. So removing the curly brackets or not having them is function equivalent. But it doesn't make it a good programming practice. In fact, if you look into this school, it might seem confusing. So my advice again, be strictly clear and put all your curly brackets no matter what, right? Just to make sure you don't do an unintentional work. Okay? okay, so yeah, let's let's stop here because the time is already gone and we want the, the, the loops to be in the beginning of the what I'm gonna do. Thanks everyone and see you tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, it's a